the Brussels Report podcast. Hello, my name is uh, Peter Kleppe. I'm the editor of Brussels uh, Report. And this is a new episode of the Brussels Report podcast. Uh, I'm very happy to have uh, with me as my guest uh, today, uh, Rod Richardson. Uh, Rod is the uh, president of the Grace Richardson Fund. And he's also the co-host of the the Climate and Freedom International Coalition Meeting, which is being hosted uh, together with Americans uh, for Tax Reform. So welcome, Rod. Uh, Thank you very much, Peter. Well, Rod, you're you're one of these people, I would say, that uh, is looking at climate and energy policy uh, from a free market perspective. And um, one of the reasons I thought it was great to interview you is that um, you are uh, basically, um, you know, promoting a project that is uh, going beyond the classical divide, uh, you know, between, let's say, um, climate zealots, uh, if if we can call them like that, that only want to have sort of more carbon taxation and things like that and uh, climate denialists, uh, people that uh, always uh, try to, you know, discuss the science behind it, which obviously is incredibly complex, and, and try to make the point that it's all fake or not such a problem. Um, so, so what I find interesting is that you're sort of trying to uh, make free marketeers more relevant in the, in the debate. And, and my first question is, so, so uh, w- what precisely and why precisely do you think that the current approach that we see both in the United States, but certainly in Europe, uh, of uh, taxing carbon, uh, wh- why is that so, um, so, so undesirable? Well, let me, let me just go back and, uh, uh, for just a second and address your point about the divide uh, between, uh, you know, the... the, the uh, uh, you know, alarmists and the deniers and, and, you know, the place of the free marketeers, this artificial divide is, is completely, you know, uh, wrong and, and wrong headed because, you know, Peter, you are, I think, uh, in favor of, uh, free trade, correct? Absolutely. You're in favor of competition, right? Absolutely. You're in favor of low taxes, right? Naturally. And property rights, right? Yes. Okay. So those are all of the building blocks that are required for effective climate policy. Because because basically, if you step back from the climate policy problem and look at the big picture, it, the question is that our technologies are not currently good enough to uh, you know enter, power the world without creating lots of carbon emissions. Right. So we need policy innovation. We need tech, technological innovation. Right. So if the problem is technological innovation, the best way to to accelerate technological innovation is with open markets, with competition, with free trade, with property rights. This this is so these are the key building blocks of the solution. So congratulations, you're already a climate activist, even if you didn't know it. <laughs> So, so that, just to address that divide, it, it, it doesn't make sense on those grounds, but there are other grounds too we can circle back and talk about this, why our, our fundamental landscape is so bizarre uh, mm. on this issue. But, uh, but no, essentially, you know, the, the argument has been made uh, by people on the right and even some libertarians who, uh, like Jeffrey Myron uh, at Harvard, uh, Though I think even now he's backing off from this position, uh, realizing that it has some flaws, you know, that that essentially the only way to fix the climate problem uh, is by uh, taxing the negative externality uh, by a carbon tax or some sort of system that effectively is a carbon tax like the ETS, where you're imposing fees and then, you know, you have a bureaucracy that transfers you know, the, the, uh, the fees or the offsets to, you know, a decarbonizing project like forestry or something like that, like a for reforestation. Um, now, the, the, the basic problem with the carbon tax as it is right now, uh, you know, it's, it's horribly inefficient, uh, you know, in the sense that we know that the effective uh, carbon price, uh, that is the price that's needed to uh, you know, produce 
uh, the change, uh, uh, you know, rapidly to avoid the uh, damages, uh, which we, you know, calculate as the social cost of carbon. So the effective carbon price is actually higher than the social cost of carbon uh, mm. by various studies. William Nordhaus, most famously, uh, did a did a study to this effect. So that, you know, first of all, there's a great deal of uncertainty about what the social cost of carbon is because it relies on all these discount rates, uh, you know, and, and studies that, you, you know, make, make that number a very fuzzy number. So, but it looks like the carbon tax that you would need to produce change is extremely high and higher than, than the, the damages that would actually occur to society if you did nothing. So, so it doesn't make sense in that, from that respect, but you know, you have to understand why it doesn't make sense in that, it, why that is so, why, why does the carbon price need to be so high? And that, that is that, uh, essentially it goes back to this problem that I mentioned before, and that is that our technologies are not now good enough. You know, the, the, the zero emission technologies are not a true substitute for fossil fuels uh, because they have drawbacks. They have weaknesses, you know, the intermittency of the renewables, the, you know, the, the, uh, the fact that an electric car, uh, you know, has very poor range and, and doesn't do well in cold weather. Um, hmm. You know, this, this kind of unreliability of the technology to, to it means that you have technological limitations. You also have market barriers, you have closed markets, you have trade barriers, you have, uh, you know, uh, economies and nations that are really close to, uh, you know, outside com companies and innovators coming in and, and, you know, you know, offering a solution on the market. So you, you have all these market barriers that are, you know, really incredibly uh, high, uh, you know, and the carbon tax is pushing against all those barriers. So it, it can push and push and push and not get anywhere. Uh, so that's why the, the price needs to be so high. So it actually makes a lot more sense to uh, attack those barriers directly uh, and bring open up the markets and to use certain kinds of free market policies that accelerate innovation, which, which I can talk about. But, but essentially... You know, if you look at the current proposal for the carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is basically the carbon tax turned into a tariff, it's the, the yes. you know, uh, uh, the imperial, uh, you know, carbon policy that, you know, imposes carbon tax. Unfortunately, unfortunately, no longer a proposal. This, this has been approved by uh, EU member states. Yes. So, so, so th this, this, this policy is basically an admission of failure, hmm. you know, it, because what, what they're, what they're essentially saying is that the, the EU has made its industries uncompetitive by, by imposing the, the ETS and its, uh, its carbon policies. Yes. And in order to compete against the rest of the world, now, it, you know, having shot itself in the foot, it needs to shoot everybody else in the foot. And that, that's, that's, that's essentially what it's saying. <laughs> that it, it, you know, it's, it's an admission that, that the carbon, uh, these kinds of carbon pricing policies make an economy uncompetitive. They cannot themselves fix leakage. So then you, from what was initially advertised as a wonderfully simple system, of, you know, a, a carbon tax, a, a, mm. you know, just simply taxing the negative answer. Oh, how, how simple that's going to be. You know, it ends up being this horribly complex system, uh, you know, where you need a, a carbon border adjustment mechanism, which nobody quite knows how it's going to work. But, you know, it may involve every company, even the cleanest companies, even the, the most the most carbon neutral, carbon negative companies, will have to pay enormous amounts of money to prove that they're carbon negative. They will have mm. to, you know, adopt these, these extremely difficult uh, and new ac accounting standards that we don't have enough accountants that are trained in carbon accounting. And, you know, nobody can really agree on what the pro proper kind of carbon accounting to use is. But, you know, to do scope two and scope three, 
accounting, accounting for everyone in your supply chain is insanely complex. I mean, it's like doing your own financial records and then financial records for every single company you, you know, you interact with, Hmm. except it's not financial records, it's carbon. And that's even more difficult to, and less, you know, sure to track than, than, than money. Absolutely. Lots of work for big four, for lawyers, <laughs> I would <laughs> no, say. No. Um, L- so so, so your, your approach um, differs from that, what you were basically advocating. Could you, could you, uh, could you explain a bit what, how you would approach it differently? Sure. Well, um, you know, the, the Grace Richardson Fund, you know, doesn't so much advocate for a policy as it pioneers, uh, you know, research into uh, the question of how to uh, attack the question of climate with free market policies. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, we, we did this because of a long tradition in the, the Richardson, uh, family foundations of addressing the issues of the day with free market mechanisms. And that's basically how, uh, all of the kinds of policies that for instance, were part of the Reagan revolution, uh, came into being by that kind of policy innovation of addressing the issues of the day with, you know, if you talk about monetarist economics or supply side economics, these were in response to the issues of the day caused by the failure of Keynesianism to uh, deliver uh, as promised the the problem of stagflation that was created by uh, Keynesian policy, which we're seeing a return of today, by the way. Hmm. Uh, but the, the um, so, so turning to um, climate, this program began because uh, the, for various reasons, the free market uh, uh, think tanks and institutes with which we'd been associated for many, many years, you know, were, were failing to address this issue and failing, you know, to, to address it with anything better than uh, denialism and skepticism and, and uh, things like uh, carbon taxes, which are not a true free market policy because mm. they impose barriers rather than lifting barriers. So we said, is there a way to do this? And we, we looked uh, and, you know, engaged firstly, quietly with economists that were associated with the Jack Kemp Foundation, with Wayne Weingarten from Pacific Research Institute, with a, a small brain trust to figure out the fundamental principles. And then when we went public, we said, you know, when we announced this program in 2015, we said, look, there's a fundamental shift going on in the market. Between 2011 and 2015, you saw the poster children for uh, clean energy, wind and solar go from being basically more expensive than fossil fuels to less expensive than fossil fuels in the best cited locations unsubsidized. And when that happens, Mm -hmm. it means that all of the policy that's been used to that point to support that is now out of date, right? The, the, you know, all the backflips that you had to do to make something uncompetitive viable. Now you don't have to do them anymore. You know, essentially when something is competitive, the most important thing to do is to let it compete. Right. And once you let it compete, right, you will, you, you know, then, then the market will accelerate, uh, you know, the, the transition to the newer, cleaner technologies, right? So your competition is very key. And that, by the way, that insight has been borne out, uh, research by Wayne Weingarten on the, um, uh, uh, comparing competitive versus uncompetitive markets in the United States shows that the competitive markets are decarbonizing 66% faster than the uncompetitive markets, mm. right? And it's it's not just competition, by the way. It can be state ownership of the, that's a, you, you know, that's state a good o- statistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah no. It, it, so it, 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 competition is very important. It shows it's important in a, you know, in, in, a, in a fully developed uh, economy, but it's even more important in the developing world. Uh, because all these developing countries, if they as they come online uh, and and uh, you know develop, are going to be if their if their energy sectors are uncompetitive. First of all, their development is going to be highly constrained, but um, it's going to be 
you know, th these, these, many of these power sectors are so, uh, not only monopolistic, but crony dominated and, you know, everybody's stealing everything they can out of the system so that they can be run on the dirtiest possible fuels, but they're delivering, you know, power only maybe two hours a day, you mm -hmm. know, and, and in that situation, development isn't even possible. And the women's liberation isn't possible. If you, if there's no power to hook up, uh, you know, a washing machine or a dryer, you know, women are spending all their time washing clothing in the river and, you know, cooking over garbage fires and giving themselves mm. lung cancer from cooking inside over, you know, fires made out of plastic and things like that. So in, in any event, um, mm -hmm. you know, so competition is very key, you know, and in addition to that, um, you know, there are new kinds of once, once you have competitive technologies, you don't need to, uh, you know, do these kinds of subsidies where you're robbing Peter to pay Paul, you know, where you're, you know, maybe picking winners and losers. You can use basic kind of technology neutral supply side tax cuts that are particularly good at accelerating innovation, which I can, I can get to describing what those are, but you can shift from the subsidy model to, a, you know, picking winners and losers models mm technocratic picking and choosing to systems that let the market decide what the clean solution is going to be uh, mm -hmm. that you use. Uh, and I can go into that, but, but essentially the, the insight that we're bringing to the table is that the, which is, which is a good idea anyway, right? I mean, a, apart yeah. from solving um, the climate challenge or improving uh, that challenge, it's basically a good idea economically anyway, right? Well, the, the, that's the point. The, you see, the key, the key solution, the key insight here is that the, 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 the key solution for climate change and the solution for poverty are one and the same thing, mm -hmm. which is more freedom, more freedom for innovators, more freedom, you know, for, you know, it, you know it, that is, you know, uh, um, you know, looking for ways to uh, accelerate the problem solvers. And you know, the way we proceeded with this was through a collaborative policy innovation, uh, you know, uh, uh, effort with other think tanks, uh, gathering together groups of think tanks and in, in what's known as charrette process, uh, you know, essentially uh one of the, the the first people we we encountered on this journey was uh amory lovins from the rocky mountain institute uh in uh aspen colorado uh and you know they're they're very well known uh in the united states uh mm -hmm. for pointing out to uh amory lovins pointed out to fortune 500 companies that they could really um improve their bottom line by making the, the companies more energy efficient by stopping wasting the use of energy. So he showed them how energy efficiency uh, investments across a Fortune 500 company could pencil out and could, you know, increase the bottom line. It was a private free market solution on these on these things. And um, essentially, um, you know, these what he what Amory suggested to us, he, he, you know, he he's you know, he's kind of a mad genius. And he he took me to his house in Aspen, Colorado, in Snowmass, actually, right next to Aspen. And at 6000 feet, uh, he has a house that has no internal heating and he has a tropical rainforest in his living room where he's growing bananas right <laughs> so i said gee this guy's a genius <laughs> and, and and we're sitting there eating his uh, bananas grown in his living room at six thousand feet and amory says to me you know rod we should do a charrette and i said okay amory what's a charrette and it's a it's a process that uh they introduced at the sorbonne uh you know in the 19th century the grad students would Mm -hmm. wheel their projects to in a cart called La Charrette uh, to the professor for grading. They would all get in the cart, the entire team, putting the finishing touches on the last parapet of their wonderful project, 
and they were said to be en charrette. And so the, the charrette became a term for these expert level meetings where you get everybody in a room and you don't let them out until they have a design. Amory had been using these things to figure out how to do Fortune 500, uh, you know, energy efficiency across a Fortune 500 company. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, he had an instinct that charrette process could be used to design policy. So, so, so um, let's skip a little bit. So what, what was the what were some of the points coming out of the of the charrette process? Uh, some of the, some of the points were were that essentially you could analyze uh, you know the free market drivers of uh, innovation and figure out what the policies are that actually accelerate uh, innovation in a, in a in a um, particular way. So we we thought a lot about clean tax cuts. You know, for instance, how to use uh, taxes to accelerate innovation now. There are some examples of technology neutral tax cuts that were introduced in the Reagan years that had a large env environmentally positive effect. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so for instance, um, there is something called uh, accelerated depreciation, right? Uh, and the, the, the idea of accelerated depreciation, it's a little bit wonky, but it's, it's fundamentally easy to understand. Uh, Prior to 1981, uh, in the United States, if you put into service, if a company bought a $10,000 piece of property, plant, and equipment, or let's say let's say make it $10 million, a $10 million property piece of property, plant, and equipment, and it had a 10-year life, then you could take as a expense against your income uh, that would reduce your taxes. So you could take a million dollars a year for 10 years, right? So you had it with well, that's called straight line depreciation. Uh, you know, you're depreciating that cost and taking that expense over 10 years. Mm -hmm. In the Reagan years, the supply siders around Reagan said, you know, look, we can improve investment, we can accelerate investment and accelerate economic growth if we allow companies to take that expense in a shorter period of time in say two or three years, they get their money back faster and the investment looks a lot better since they're getting their money back faster uh, because of the time value of money, right? So by this, this, this policy actually not only worked for economic growth, for accelerated investment, it did, it did have those effects, but it had another effect which they did not expect. It had an environmental benefit. Okay. Essentially, this helped spur the energy efficiency revolution that Amory Lovins had been working on. Suddenly, all these energy efficiency investments penciled out with accelerated depreciation. But not only that, what they found was that simply by making it cheaper to put newer equipment into service faster, it meant that companies, all kinds of different companies, all kinds of different industries were putting the latest, newest equipment into the service. And the latest, newest equipment was more efficient. It was cleaner. It was built to higher standards. Mm. The newest stuff is always better than the old stuff, yeah. right? They're, the companies are always trying to innovate. Not only that, there's another mechanism, and that is that, you know, democratically, the environmental standards are getting higher for how the codes for building a house, the codes for constructing an air conditioner or a refrigerator. So you have a combination of competition and, you know, uh, you know, some regulation also driving the improvements. So essentially, just by lowering the cost of putting new property, plant and equipment into service uh, through a tax cut, you get an environmental benefit. Okay. So, so we can, we've you know, and, the, and Rod, if I can, can um, so you have this, um, let's say, lower taxes, opening up markets, uh, this yeah. um, these kind of techniques like appreciated, uh, accelerated um, depreciation. But let's assume the United States would go for that um, and have success. But but how, how would you sort of incentivize the rest of the world to to go along? With those well, that kind of that's. It. You see, that's exactly what we were thinking of, because there really is no 
climate solution in just one country. Mm. And pol policies like accelerated depreciation could be adopted by countries all over the world, but they're not. Yeah, because the argument is always that, oh, uh, whatever we do, uh, China and India don't really care all that much or not at all. If you look at their CO2 uh, emission uh, being increased all the time. Uh, so, so that's going to be the argument. So, so how do you incentivize uh, not only Europe but but them? Well, you know, we we know now that that competition makes is a very important, and and not only that, but things like property rights in the rainforest. You know, the rainforest deforestation is is largely a product of of uh, nations in the rainforest countries trying to own far too much rainforest land. Uh, and, you know, they, they, they cannot protect the land that they own. Mm. And they are, um, you know, because they have weak property rights and poor rule of law and too much government ownership, they're, they're you know, marginalizing private conservation efforts that could be much more accessible. In the United States, for instance, we have private property rights plus a conservation framework, again, very important Reagan era tax uh, cut introduced was the conservation easement tax deduction, mm -hmm. uh, which treats conservation as a charitable tax deduction. And uh, that has resulted in the growth of 33 million acres on U.S. forests. So imagine if we were able to spread that kind of idea around the world. So if you have an international agreement, right, that mm -hmm. that that would encourage countries to open up their markets to competition, to allow frameworks for private conservation that are more effective than uh, strictly relying on governments to do everything. Uh, you know, that would be, make an improvement, but how do you incentivize that? You know, how do you incentivize that? So we went, some of our working groups went to look at this idea of accelerated depreciation or immediate expensing for property, plant, and equipment and turned it into a framework that you can internationalize. Mm -hmm. So one, one way to do that is by using tax exempt debt for investments in property, plant and equipment, right? So you're basically going to the capital markets and the, you know having um, you know, bonds, loans, even savings accounts that are used to finance debt and the interest on that debt would be tax exempt. Right. Mm -hmm. So it would be it would be used for prop all property, plant and equipment. Right. And the way it would work as part of an international agreement would be it would be reciprocal in the agreement so that essentially <clears throat> any <clears throat> kind of capitalist <clears throat> in any of these uh, countries could raise uh, tax exempt debt bonds, loans, savings accounts, mutual funds, right? Uh, you know, in in that country, uh, in the form of, uh, in all these different forms, it could be bankers or project developers. And they would be able to pool this money uh, in and then invest it in every participating country in property, plant, and equipment, in the latest property, plant, and equipment that's more efficient, that's built to the higher standards. So, so you're, so you're uh, basically... Un unlike, unlike ESG, it would not be punitive, but it would be sort of, you know, rewarding. Uh, do I that, summarize that well? That's right. It, it, it recognizes that merely by, by encouraging the next gener investment in the next generation of technology, you're accelerating the pace of change across all technologies, mm -hmm. right? So that is, that is one uh, example of a clean tax cut. We call that, by the way, Innovation Acceleration Bond Loans and Savings Accounts. The acronym is ENABLES. So these, these, the, the use of ENABLES, uh, you know, basically enables sustainable development it enable it it, it it accelerates capital flows between all the participating countries uh for uh upgrades to technology uh mm -hmm. in comp in competitive markets right mm -hmm. so so that that you know uh you know goes to all kinds of things you know you know uh, uh the the upgraded, uh, you know, uh, you know, solar, wind, uh, you know, even oil and gas that are, are you know, better at uh, 
controlling emissions at the wellhead, uh, you know, nuclear, uh, you know, e even things that are excluded, for instance, technologies like ocean geothermal, for instance, mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that, you know, you know, the, you know, clean technologies that are uh, lesser known and often excluded from the lists of winners and losers that are picked by the technocrats, mm. you know, simply because they don't know that these uh, other kinds of technologies <laughs> exist and are out there. Yeah, interesting. <clears throat> you know, so... Um, I guess, did, did you see this week that uh, Westinghouse, the American uh, producer of nuclear plants, if I can say, they came up with a new uh, model of SMRs? which basically involves uh, four mini uh, nuclear plants that fit um, on the surface of one football field. So, so perhaps, yeah, with, with, you know, incentives that you describe, free market incentives, uh, technologically neutral incentives, technology like this would perhaps, you know, get more of a chance, right? Uh, I I agree that the the SMRs look like they might be the best way to do nuclear in a cost effective and safe way. Mm. Uh, that that they're you know they're they're you know the the large conventional nuclear plants. It's hard to think about how to do those in a truly free market way because. You know they, yeah. you know they they require a public private partnership at very least with the state and all kinds of guarantees about, mm. uh, you know, uh, uh, insurance, etc. Um, so they they end up looking quasi socialist a lot yeah. of the times, but the the SMRs, uh, you know, because they're basically factory produced. You know, you can, you know, print these out like cookie cutters. You know, it's, a, it's a, you know, it, I mean, it, it, it is your you have the potential for economies of scale, mm. uh, you know, but by mass producing nuclear power in a in a in a standardized way. So um, uh, so it, 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 to me, it, it looks like a it's potentially a more promising business model uh, and uh, it's definitely something that should be uh, encouraged and allowed. I mean, especially given uh, all of the uh, permitting problems that are being encountered by uh, wind and solar and the massive mm. amount of land area that they use. You know, the mm. you know there's there's a tremendous. Wall Street Journal has an article today about the 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 massive pushback that the um, uh, these trillion dollar uh, subsidy programs uh, for wind and solar and other clean technologies are getting, they're getting blocked at the local level uh, yes. because people don't want their entire landscape covered with wind turbines and solar panels. There's, mm. there's an environmental objection to doing that. Uh, that is, you know, that that is being brought to the fore. People, you know, a, you know, that, you know, people are, are, it, it looks like we need to pay attention to the eco-modernist uh, argument that a, you know, a more concentrated, smaller footprint is more ecologically beneficial so mm. that SMRs are something we should definitely be, you know, in the mix and should be considered. Um, but, you know, I'm not a champion, uh, you know, or, or an opponent of any particular technology. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think that they all should be allowed to play and prove themselves. Um, exactly. But, uh, you know, so, so yes, we need to make sure that that's really, really true. Okay, great. I thought that was um, very informative. Uh, maybe there's one thing you want to say about the, you know, the, the climate and freedom international coalition meeting. And yes, maybe uh, explain uh, if if any listeners are interested how they can uh, take part. Uh, sure, uh, you can uh, email me at rrr.grf at gmail dot com. Uh, that's rrr.grf at gmail dot com, uh, and. Uh, Anyone who's listening, if you would like an invitation to join the Climate and Freedom International Coalition meeting, 
Uh, this is largely for free market think tanks who are interested in exploring uh, free market uh, climate policy solutions. Um, you know, there are uh, many different think tanks that are, are entering this area at this point who are uh, interested in joining the discussion. I think it's very interesting that um, the, the Tholos Foundation, or that is the new name for the Americans for Tax Reform Foundation, are interested in, in this space. I think that they, they you know, mm. they really haven't been present and, it, you know, it's great to see them helping to uh, lead and facilitate uh, a conversation here. And I don't think they do that unless they were uh, convinced that you could tackle this problem using free trade, competition, low taxes, private property rights, uh, and traditional free market solutions like this. So if you want to right. explore how to do that, uh, drop me an email and uh, we can send you an, an invitation to join the meeting. It's the last Thursday of every month uh, from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. And, uh, and well, I'll <laughs> okay, well, um, Rod Richardson, thank you uh, very much. Well, thank you very much, Peter. The Brussels Report Podcast.